Hey, good morning, church. It's good to have you back with us today. Uh, hopefully you had a great Thanksgiving and got to enjoy it with your family and got to do some, uh, I don't know, some fun things. Maybe you got to do some shopping. Maybe you uh, got to spend some time outdoors or whatever you enjoy doing. Hopefully you had a great Thanksgiving with your family, though. Um, we had a good Thanksgiving, went up to North Florida and visited with my in-laws and had a good time up there and just good to get away and um, enjoyed some good food and good games and a lot of fellowship and fun. So hopefully you enjoyed the same thing. Um, we are back in the scripture today in the book of Acts. Um, things are kind of uh, back on track normal for this week after a weird week of Thanksgiving. Uh, so that means that all of our regular Bible studies here at the church are open uh, this week. We'll have our uh, our groups meeting at different people's homes for Bible study. We also have, um, we also have our um, Wednesday night programs. Uh, so we have a Bible study on Wednesday mornings, and we also have uh, Wednesday evening. We have our main uh, Bible studies that are happening. So uh, student ministry, kids ministry, nursery, uh, adults as well. We've got our marriage class that we're going to continue on Wednesday night. So we'd love to have you come out and join us this Wednesday. I um, want to remind you also, if you can, if you haven't got an opportunity to grab some toys for the Christmas store, we would really appreciate you doing that. Um, we've got a lot of people brought in things, but we're always looking for more because the more gifts we have, the more uh, families we can invite and engage with and be a blessing to. So if you haven't got a chance to go and grab a couple toys from Walmart or Target or any of the stores you like to shop at, um, we would really encourage you to do that if you have the opportunity to do that. Um, we know that this has been a challenging year for many people, and so it might not be in your budget to do that, and we understand that. Um, but if you have the capacity, if you have the ability to do that, we would love to have you partner with us as we bless some families from Eustis Elementary School and our community and our church family, too, that are just struggling this year. So i uh, love to have you do that. Uh, pray about that. You can drop those off at the church any day during the week or you can bring them on Sunday morning, but we need them by this Sunday so we can begin to uh, go through all the toys and make sure that we have enough and how they correspond with families that are coming and things like that. So uh, please do that. Uh, today we're back in the book of Acts chapter 8. Uh, we left off last week with the story of the church becoming uh, mobile. Uh, it wasn't that they became mobile um, really uh, at their own desire. It was almost a forced mob mobility. Uh, we saw that the church in Jerusalem uh, underwent some persecution and hostility and violence broke out against the church. And so many people left Jerusalem and many of the Christians left and traveled to new, uh, new cities and new lands uh, to start their businesses and their families over again. And everywhere they went, they preached the gospel and took the good news of Jesus with them. And churches began, and, and, uh, and these communities thrived with the gospel of Jesus. So kind of a neat thing how God did that. Uh, we're going to look at a story today that is kind of interesting, kind of a, uh, an odd story. Um, but uh, let me just read a couple of verses here. It says that Philip, that's one of the disciples of Jesus, Philip, uh, went down. This is in Acts, 5, uh, Acts 8, verse 5. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When he heard the when the hurt when the excuse me when the crowds when the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks and for with shrieks impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Such an interesting thing. First century, God enabled uh, certain people to have the ability to do miraculous things. We see that here in uh, Acts chapter 8. Uh, they saw the, the, the things that Philip said, and they saw the things that he did. Uh, God gave Philip the ability to do miracles where people were healed of sicknesses and illnesses. Paralyzed people were given their mobility back. Uh, impure spirit, so uncleanliness in people's body was healed um, and uh, pardoned in these people's lives. And it got the attention of people. Now, here's the interesting thing, and we've talked about this before. I think it's important to, to note this, that um, we asked the question, well, how come God doesn't do that today? Uh, 
Uh, why don't we see those kind of things happening today? And um, I would say that um, we don't want to put God in a box and say that God doesn't do that, but God definitely manifests himself in different ways at different times. Um, one of the things we see is that in moments where it is absolutely needed, um, when the gospel message or the message from God needs uh, a certain authority and a certain credibility, we see that God enables miracles to be done. Um, but one of the things we, we sometimes assume, we assume sometimes that miracles were just everyday occurrences in um, biblical times. But if a miracle became an everyday occurrence, it would cease to be a miracle. Miracles are miracles because they are uncommon, but not just uncommon, but they are supernatural. Uh, they they have no um, they have no earthly explanation. Uh, something that that defies the law of nature uh, it is a miracle. And so, when a person who is paralyzed uh, automatically regains the strength and feeling in his legs and able to walk, that's a miracle. Uh, when someone is um, uh, blind and is given their sight back, that is a miracle. It is a supernatural. Um, not natural phenomenon. Um, but the thing about miracles is they don't happen uh, all the time in the scripture. We, we sometimes think that, but if we look at the scripture chronologically, we see that miracles happen only at certain times. Um, and there are clusters of miracles that happen throughout the pages of the scripture. And so if we look at the chronological uh, evidence, we see that miracles, there's a lot of miracles that happen around the time of uh, Moses, there are a lot of time, a lot of miracles that happen around the time of uh, a couple of prophets in the Old Testament. We think of Elijah and Elisha. Uh, there are a lot of miracles that take place around the time of the disciples and Jesus' ministry, um, but not all the way through the Bible. We don't see these miracles happen all the way through the Bible. They're in clusters at certain times. A good way to understand the, the role of miracles is that God allows miracles to happen in the Scripture to do two things. One is to give authority and credibility to the message, and then second of all, to the messenger. Um, when people come, uh, when Moses came to Pharaoh, God gave Moses the ability to do miracles. Why? Because Moses was a nobody, right? Nobody knew Moses. Moses didn't have any authority. He didn't have any credentials behind his name to go and speak to Pharaoh. So God gave him power through the miracles so that Pharaoh would listen, so that Pharaoh would recognize this is a man of authority and I need to listen to what he is saying. Uh, same thing with the prophets in the Old Testament. God would give them the ability to do a miracle. Why? Because their, they, their message was unknown and they were relatively unknown as well. And so God gave them authority through the miracles they did. Same thing with the disciples. When the disciples began to do ministry in the early church, um, their message was brand new. It was this message of a carpenter that died for our sins and now we're gonna uh, trust in him and so it was kind of this thing that people were really uh, skeptical of that and so God allowed these men um, to do miraculous things to give credibility to the message they had but also their the messenger themselves uh, they were fishermen they were tax collectors they were uh, run-of-the-mill people and they needed some credentials, they needed some authority behind them. And so God gave these people these abilities to do that. The miracles were always done in order to uh, auth uh, authenticate, authenticate the message that was being given by them. So that's important to understand. So in verse 9, we get into this really interesting story where in this town, there was a man named Simon who practiced sorcery, uh, witchcraft of, si uh, of types, um, and things of that nature. He had wowed people because he had um, he had wowed people by his uh, works of sorcery, and many people followed him. God began to do a great work in that city. Uh, Philip began to preach the message of the gospel. Many people began to follow the the message of the gospel and put their hope in Jesus. Many of them were baptized. Um, this man Simon was convicted and gave his life to Jesus as well. He was baptized. There's a story in the, the latter part or the middle part of that section in verse 14 that says the apostles came down from Jerusalem to see what was going on. They heard that the gospel was being preached and lives were being changed in Samaria. And so they come down to see what was going on. They see that God was doing this great work. And so the apostles begin to lay hands on people, giving them that ability to do miraculous things so that the gospel might continue to go forward. 
again, so that more credibility would be given to the message and the messenger. Simon sees what is going on. Simon sees, oh man, the apostles, if they lay their hands on people, it gives people the opportunity to do miracles. Simon comes to them and says, hey, I would like to have that power. I would like to have the power to lay my hands on people and give them powers and special abilities. Obviously, Simon's heart was not right. Simon's heart was in this for his own gain and not for the gain of the church, not for the flourishing of the gospel in the community. And so when this took place, when Simon asked about this, Peter answered. And I just want to read this, and I think this is important for us to recognize. Peter answers, verse 20, May your money perish with you. May your money perish with you um, because you thought that you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in hopes that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. I put that in there. I wanted to read that because I think that there's a danger for all of us. When we talk about joining the work of God, when we talk about joining God at what he is doing, we talk about being part of the church, we have to be careful that we don't um, allow ourselves to drift into this uh, selfish nature. That, that we shouldn't want to be part of the gospel work so that we would get glory, so that we would get credit, so we would get fame, so we would get the applause of men, right? That our work in the gospel, joining God and partnering with God, partnering with the church is never about our glory. It should never be about our glory. And so I would just say this is a wise thing for all of us to do is let's check our heart. Let's check our motives. Why are we doing what we're doing? We can serve our neighbor. We can bless people all with the wrong motives. Um, and it won't accomplish anything in us. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, he says, let's not do our acts of righteousness to be seen by men, but rather let's do our acts of righteousness so that God might get the glory, right? Matthew chapter 5 says, uh, do your uh, acts of righteousness uh, so that men might look at Jesus, so that people might see the majesty of God, not see how good we are. Um, so I would just encourage you, man, if, if you're a good servant of the Lord, um, serve faithfully, do great things, but don't boast about it on, so, on social media. Uh, don't post that stuff on social media. Don't highlight how good you are. Don't highlight what you're doing and things of that nature. Um, let's be careful not to have the wrong motives in our acts of service before the King of Kings. Um, Jesus said in Matthew 6, he says, if we do our acts of righteousness to be seen by men and get the applause of men, we will get that. We'll get the applause of men. We'll get the attaboys. We'll get the pat on the backs. But that's all we will get. Um, Jesus says, if we do our acts of righteousness for men to see, we will get the applause of men, but we will not get the applause of heaven. Um, but if we do our acts of service in secret and don't highlight ourselves and our own ability, uh, then we will get the applause of heaven. And that's much more desirable for us. So let's pray today. God, thank you for your word and thank you for the instruction we see in it. God, we thank you that you give us what we need at just the right times. Uh, for the disciples in the early church, God, you gave them the ability to do miraculous things. Um, God, you've given us your word that we have. We can stand on the authority of the Bible. Uh, we don't have to have miracles necessarily to do ministry, God. Um, and so I just pray that you would help us be content with what you've given us, um, that we might be faithful in what you've given to us so that we might continue to do the work you've called us to. Help us to never have a selfish attitude as we do the work uh, of the gospel. Help us, God, to have uh, clear motives and pure motives as we share the good news, as we serve people, as we bless our community. Help us to be those people that you would be proud to call your children. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, guys, hope you have a great, idea, or a great day today. Uh, look for ways and ideas to serve other people and be a blessing to them. And we'll look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning, 9 a.m. God bless.